Good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Elaine Martis. She will be delivering the Rudin Case Dean's Lecture uh, entitled Cancer Genetics and Genomics. Dr. Martis is co-executive director of the Institute for Genomic Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, where she's also the professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Dr. Martis received a PhD in chemistry and biochemistry uh, at uh, the University of Oklahoma, and then subsequently went on to become an esteemed member of faculty at Washington University School of Medicine from 1993 to through, through to 2016, where she has risen and become really an internationally recognized expert in genomics and, and in a field that I'm getting acquainted with immunogenomics, and I think she's one of the finest in immunogenomics today. She was a member of the team leader that contributed to sequencing completion of the Human Genome Project and on the very first sequencing and analysis of a whole cancer genome using uh, next generation sequencing methods. Her work has led to the characterization uh, of multiple uh, cancer genomes. She's uh, really contributed to the development of methods to characterize uh, cancer heterogeneity, uh, identifying resistance mechanisms, and also, um, as you'll hear her speak today a little bit about um, being an, a very important contributor to developing one of the first new antigen uh, vaccines um, uh, published in science uh, recently and um, using dendritic cells, one of our favorite vaccine adjuvants here. She's extremely prolific. She's published over 300 papers uh, and has been uh, hi highly recognized, receiving a prestigious award from the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, the Morton K, uh, K. Schwartz Award. Um, she is also a member of the Board of Directors AACR and the Program Committee Chair. So we're delighted to have you here today to speak. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be back at Sinai for Sinai Innovations. I think I gave a talk at this um, conference probably three years ago now, and a lot's changed in a fairly short period of time. Um, so I wanted to um, focus initially on cancer genomics and genetics, but then take a deep dive into immunogenomics. Um, so I already warned Nina that I was going to stray a little bit from pure genetics and genomics into what I think is one of the more interesting current applications of our uh, sort of genomics Swiss Army knife, if you will. Um, I want to start by sort of emphasizing that genomics is becoming more and more in, ingrained into clinical approaches to uh, cancer, in particular cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, and this is a not yet released figure from a, a review that I'm writing um, for Nature uh, Review's Clinical Oncology that sort of encapsulates the current status of where we're at with using genomics in, in cancer um, clinical diagnostics. So really, I'm sort of starting with a relatively conscripted data set here, just using tumor versus normal um, from next generation sequencing, aligning that to the human genome and calling variants. And we can come up with essentially both a collection of somatic variants, those that are unique to the tumor material itself, to those cells and germline variants that um, are equally important as we again uh, begin to sort of appreciate um, the um, inherited um, constitutional uh, contribution to the development of this disease. And in particular, if we focus on just the somatic variants for a moment, as you can see, I've sort of listed out here a variety of applications of these data um, towards uh, clinical treatment decision making. In particular, for some time now, um, since the mid 2000s, even before next generation sequencing came along, we've been able to sort of partner known pathogenic driver mutations to specific targeted therapies. And of course, um, over the past uh, 10 years or so, this is um, extraordinarily expanded as we both better understand the um, genomic lesions that can lead to the development and onset of cancer and its progression, as well as um, from the efforts of, of clinical um, chemists and uh, synthetic chemists to come up with appropriate um, uh, drugs to target those known drivers. And of course, um, this also illustrates that drivers come to us in a variety of forms and fashions. So simple point mutations um, that activate or inactivate uh, gene fusion drivers um, 
caused by chromosomal sc scale changes, inversions, translocations, et cetera, and that put together two genes that didn't belong together and result in uh, fusion drivers. And then also well known for some time now, different um, amplified cancer driver genes. And these are all subject to a variety of types of small molecule and antibody-based inhibitors. More recently, however, and as I'll talk about today, the interpretation of these data has been expanded significantly to identify novel peptides that are unique to the tumor, and in the context of each patient's um, unique HLA molecule combinations, can be modeled to essentially predict those most antigenic peptides that result from um, gene uh, changes at the level of DNA. And so this is immunogenomics, which I'll focus on a lot um, throughout the rest of my talk. Um, but in particular, we can use uh, I I immunogenomics in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, just from calculating the mutational load of these somatic variants that have been identified, we can um, quite simply um, apply a not perfect but um, interesting association between high mutation load and the likelihood to respond to checkpoint blockade inhibitors. And then taking that a bit further, as I'll talk about in great detail, again, modeling with the patient's HLA molecules, information that we can also get from the DNA sequencing data, um, we can predict neoantigenic peptides. Those both have a role in predicting immunotherapy response, but in particular, designing precision or personalized vaccines that are unique to each patient. Because interestingly, these neoantigens are rarely driver mutations. Then just to focus for a couple of seconds on the germline variants, um, in particular, the surprises in germline are that for both large numbers of pediatric and adult patients, we now know that the constitutional contribution to cancer development is probably upwards of 10 percent, um, at least 10 to 12 percent uh, so far in very, very large data sets um, that uh, have doubled this number from what was previously um, suspected before large-scale sequencing of normal um, constitutional DNA of people who developed cancer. In particular, now more recently, these um, aspects of germline inheritance have therapeutic implications, in particular with microsatellite instability and the FDA's recent approval of an anti-PD-1 drug, pembrolizumab, for any tissue site histology in patients with microsatellite instability. And then also recently, the use of PARP inhibitors, often in combination with chemotherapy, um, for patients with BRCA1-2 or other um, homologous repair defects, as well as um, the use of polymerase epsilon in certain treatment considerations, um, in particular for checkpoint blockade. So as you can see, there's sort of a rich um, number of ways that we can assort these data from simple genomic metrics um, to um, really apply this to the clinical situation for any patient um, that we're seeing in front of us. So immunogenomics in particular, as I'm trying to illustrate from this sort of funnel diagram, has had a dramatic um, a application to cancer uh, just in the past recent few years. Um, this is not sort of a new idea, I want to point out, for the students and trainees in the audience, uh, as, as our next generation-based ideas are really just amplifying sort of earlier ideas from the sort of... Um, pioneers in this field, if you will, who in the late 80s and 90s, with admittedly um, less technology tools at their fingertips than we have today, um, really sort of started by trying to clone out using traditional cloning methods um, and old school sequencing to identify using um, conventional approaches to immunology uh, these um, sort of tumor-specific neoantigens or mutant antigens, as they were called back then. Um, while these early works were important, they didn't, as I said, have the sort of technological advantages that we have today with advanced sequencing as well as computational analytics to evaluate um, and, and uh, interpret these uh, mutant peptides in the context of each patient's HLA uh, molecules. And so this was first um, proposed by Allison and Vogelstein in a paper in 2008, just at the dawn of next generation sequencing, if you will. Um, where um, the use, uh, the, the large-scale sequencing in the Vogelstein lab at that point in time, largely by Sanger sequencing and PCR amplification, had begun to identify lots of mutations in cancer genes, not all of which were drivers, 
Um, and together, these two visionaries basically proposed that it might be the case that these neoantigenic peptides that were being identified in larger numbers could have a role in um, uh, this uh, immunological approach to cancer. Um, I was happy to work with Bob Schreiber then, um, building on these uh, initial ideas um, uh, using a next generation sequencing to identify mouse tumor specific neoantigens. And there was also a paper um, in 2012 uh, from Uger Sahin's group uh, in Germany. And then just the next year, two groups actually uh, utilized this approach in humans. And as you can see from 2013 on, it's been a bit of an explosion in terms of the application of immunogenomics. Um, these two papers were mentioned yesterday um, in terms of the back-to-back -back nature papers, again from the German group and from Kathy Wu's group in, in, uh, in Boston, um, combining personalized vaccines, in this case, um, in some patients with checkpoint blockade uh, therapies and showing very durable responses in melanoma. So um, in our work uh, with Jerry Lynette and Beatrice Carino um, that uh, Nina alluded to in her introduction, um, we basically developed a computational pipeline to perform all of these manipulations that are required to start from simple genomics data and interpret out neoantigens. And this is um, represented in this diagram shown here. Uh, basically, we just need these um, essential building blocks from genomics, the comparison of tumor to normal to identify mutations, as I've already told you. The use of the exome sequencing data from the normal um, can tell us the HLA haplotypes of the patient through a specialized pipeline um, that aligns those reads to these highly repetitive gene families and interprets the data from those. And then the combination of peptides identified unique to the tumor with the HLA um, in through a modeling approach um, can give us these neoantigens, with which we then check using RNA sequencing data from the tumor to ensure that the neoantigens that we're predicting are actually expressed. And this is a very important step in melanomas where most of this work has been done because these are very high mutation load tumors based on UV damage to the DNA and fully 50 to 60 percent of the predicted mutations actually never show up in the RNA data uh, from those tumors. And so this is a really critical filter that we introduced early on into the process. And so we, uh, we have used this process in a variety of ways. And what I'll talk to you about today are sort of some improvements to the process um, and that build upon our early results and uh, hopefully will um, broaden this out to low mutation load tumors in addition to um, the ones that have already been uh, used. So I want to talk first about the use of immunogenomics to predict neoantigen load, pure and simple. Um, and this is, uh, as I mentioned already, important because of early findings. Um, this has now been expanded upon by the group at Hopkins, uh, but was originally reported in 2015 in a small clinical trial that showed that patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors um, actually responded better to anti-PD-1 blockade. Um, in, in, and this was um, expanded out and resulted in the FDA decision that I mentioned um, that happened just late this summer. Um, we use this paradigm ourselves in uh, diagnosing and treating a patient um, that we reported at the end of 2016 in Cancer Discovery. Since this is published, I'll just go over it briefly. Uh, but this um, very interesting patient who came to our attention having developed a large glioblastoma that was removed by um, surgery and then subsequently developed a drop metastasis lower in the spinal column that was also removed by surgery. In between sort of this glioblastoma and the drop metastasis through a variety of testing mechanisms, um, including a very high mutation load through form foundation medicine and a subsequent evaluation in the germline that identified polymerase epsilon as uh, carrying a pathogenic mutation as well as a variant of unknown significance, we were able to uh, put this patient on to pembrolizumab um, and subsequently, just a few weeks after being on drug, he did develop a second metastasis, although we think that this was um, already in the works, but just not, a, uh, you know, evaluable by imaging at the time uh, when this metastasis was detected. Nonetheless, because uh, this uh, third tumor was also removed surgically, we then had a beautiful progression series, if you will, to evaluate using uh, genomics um, in the way that I've just described. And what we were able to show 
and um, in this patient, including the use of conventional, uh, you know, immunohistochemistry, was that the patient in the primary tumor, between the primary tumor and development of metastasis, did not have any, uh, you know, sort of evidence of immune infiltrates, but after the intermediate of uh, pembrolizumab, had a very large infiltration of a variety of different types of T cells. Um, we were also able to use the RNA-seq data from this patient's three tumors to uh, investigate and show the difference between metastasis one and metastasis two in terms of newer approaches that can take RNA-seq data from tumors and essentially classify the immune molecules that are present. And those data largely overlap with the immunohistochemistry data. So I didn't mention this approach in my previous diagram, but this is yet another way to sort of slice and dice uh, the next generation sequencing data um, to better understand treatment response. So um, now I want to take a look at neoantigens to vaccines, which is where I'll spend the rest of my time. And I'm really describing out the immunogenomics approach to personalized vaccine design. Um, and so, um, as I mentioned, this work with Bob Schreiber's group, this is a second paper from 2014, building on the work that we published in 2012, um, where we use the same paradigm um, in terms of the evaluation of next generation sequencing data, identifying expressed mutations, and then predicting neoantigens and applying filters to weed out false positives. On this particular paper, what we then did was sort of move forward to the next step, which was to synthesize peptides that were um, long peptide equivalents of our predicted neoantigens. We then studied these in a variety of in vitro and ex vivo uh, analyses, which were um, published, but most importantly, then turned these um, peptides into vaccines, into mice that were actively growing on uh, the tumor cell line that we had sequenced um, in the beginning to identify the neoantigens. Um, and in this paper, we were able to show that mice that were actively growing tumors um, had a response to these long peptide vaccines. We then moved this um, information forward into humans, um, and I've already alluded to this study, but let me just walk you through it. So um, using a series of three, ultimately six patients, only three of which were reported in this science paper, we um, isolated dendritic cells from the patients, differentiated them ex vivo, and matured them in culture, and then added in um, the specific derived peptides that we had identified from the sequencing of their tumors. These then loaded onto the dendritic cells, and the dendritic cells became the uh, infused vaccine going back into the patient. And over a dosing schedule of uh, three doses, a period of two weeks interval, we then evaluated the response in these patients um, to the vaccine, including the evaluation of any uh, severe adverse events, which is obviously part of these um, early phase one type trials. And what we were able to show in this paper is that um, for these three patients, MEL21, 38, and 218, looking before vaccine as well as after vaccine in these flow cytometry analyses using dextromer assays, that for each patient, as you can see at the bottom, three of the seven neoantigen peptides actually were successful in eliciting a measurable CD8 positive T cell response. Um, and a good example of this sort of pre-vaccine versus post-vaccine is the enhancement in this upper uh, right-hand quadrant on the flow cytometry diagram, which you can see for then the adjacent peptide is not there. What I want to point out also, um, just, for, just to emphasize a point that I made earlier, is that if you look at the names of these genes across the top here, many of them are actually not known cancer genes, in fact, the majority. And so it's actually through now evaluating lots of patients in this type of an approach um, to predict neoantigens, the case that you rarely see known cancer pathogenic mutations um, that are actually um, neoantigens. So these are largely the, you know, sort of passenger mutations as we commonly refer to them, but may turn out in, in, to be incredibly important. Um, and so um, I mentioned the result, three of seven neoantigen peptides. Uh, I want to talk next about how we're going to try and improve upon those results um, with uh, advanced bioinformatic analyses of our data. 
Um, but I also want to leave this behind and just say that we did not report severe adverse events in any of the patients, including the three that were reported in this study. Um, and so as was alluded to yesterday in the discussion, one of the advantages of choosing these truly somatic tumor-specific mutations is that the off-target uh, effects, if you will, in normal peptides are extraordinarily reduced. So one of the questions that we've been looking at recently that I just wanted to segue into is, What's the impact in neoantigen prediction of sort of personalized variants, if you will? The fact that we all have about three million positions in our genomes that are pretty unique to ourselves and obviously are inherited, um, but differentiate us from, uh, from other individuals. So what we evaluated in this case was um, a data set that we already understood from several patients. I'm looking for the prevalence of another somatic variant that was present within the peptide window that we choose um, when we go through and uh, evaluate around a variant in the, in the DNA of the tumor to look for neoantigen um, uh, likelihood. We also wanted to evaluate the prevalence of germline or inherited polymorphisms within the peptide because indeed certain polymorphisms can also change the amino acid sequence of an individual peptide relative to the human reference sequence, which is of course the scaffold against which we measure all of these um, variants to begin with. So how often do these cause an amino acid change? And in fact, how often does this affect our predicted binding to MHC class one? And so this is kind of a pictorial representation of what I just told you. The wild type peptide is of course according to the human genome reference. A somatic variant may introduce a novel amino acid in this um, particular window that we're looking at for this DNA sequence. But indeed in this, in this individual you might also have a germline SNP that also changes this first amino acid and an adjacent somatic variant that changes the one just next to it. And so this is a very different, potentially, uh, peptide in the neoantigen evaluation than the one that we started with, which would have originally been our prediction in the first place. And so what we've done is basically just modify our pipeline slightly. So we still start from uh, exome sequencing. Here we evaluated a large number of tumor normal pairs from 137 cases. We do germline and somatic variant calling from alignment and uh, algorithmic examination of the data. And then we perform an intersection of both the somatic as well as proximal amino acid altering variants um, to get a picture of these um, peptides as shown here using sort of a 100 base pair window on either side of the somatic SNV um, that we've already identified as a putative neoantigen. And this just shows the flow diagram, if you will, where we start by uh, finding these overlapping amino acid altering variants. This is the number of SNVs that were detected, and then we um, filter these a bit, and then um, end up with a high quality set of about a thousand missense SNVs, which conform to specific um, filters that just ensure us that those are real variants. Um, and then when we move these forward in this very large data set, this is sort of the information that we get in terms of the distribution of in-phase variants, those variants that are in the same reading frame and will, uh, uh, will change the amino acid sequence of the peptide that we're predicting. Um, and you can see that within this 100 base pair window, filtered down now in the blue to just those variants that are in-phase, we actually see a reasonable distribution regardless of the number of mutations overall that are predicted for that individual. So individuals with high mutation load don't differ significantly from those with low mutation loads. And then when we finally distill this out in the context of the HLA molecules for these individual 137 um, patients, what we can see is that in some cases, when we correct for the wild type and mutant peptide sequences, as circled here in red, we get for this one example, and it's of course an extreme, but just to show you what's possible, a 20-fold difference in the neoantigen um, binding strength uh, comparing what we would have gotten before to what we get now with the corrected peptide. And so now if we sort of take a look at these different windows of distribution, if you look along the bottom here, this is for eight MERS up to 14 MERS, which we're commonly putting into our predicting pipelines um, for class one neoantigens, um, we can see that for good peptides, we have a differential of those that are gained as well as lost as a result of making these um, specific corrections.
and these also differ in terms of the um, delta uh, binding score as well. So we think that this is going to be an important refinement to add into our neoantigen prediction pipeline and may actually increase not only the number of candidate neoantigens that we identify, but also the um, identifying the really um, appropriate neoantigens to be focusing in on. And as I'll talk about, um, just to finish up, this can be um, these neoantigen-derived vaccines, depending upon which way you approach them, can also be relatively expensive treatment modalities. And we want to get these right so that we have the maximum impact on patients um, who are receiving our vaccines. So beyond the point mutation-based neoantigens, we also wanted to start exploring out to other types of variants in the genome that are admittedly more rare, but in some cases may pre present actually very strong neoantigens, and I'll describe what these are like. Um, one of the reasons for pursuing this is because we wanted to move now from high mutation load tumors like melanomas and lung cancers and bladder cancers down to um, relatively low mutation load tumors. Um, as shown here in the uh, diagram, um, one of the clinical trials that we opened when I was at Washington University was in um, a, a vaccine trial for women with triple negative breast cancer, for which there's just a single standard of care, um, which is um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radiation. And in this window of opportunity trial, we could evaluate their genomes and potentially manufacture a personalized vaccine that they could then receive at the end of their radiation treatment, either uh, with synthetic long peptides, as I showed from earlier in the mouse, or using a polyepitope DNA vaccine with the different neoantigens pieced in together behind a human promoter. In addition, we recently received funding to try these approaches in pancreatic cancer patients, again, a low mutation load tumor. And now with my uh, new role at a children's hospital, where in children we know the mutation rate in general is extraordinarily low, but actually some of the most important drivers in kids are actually due to fusion peptides, we may indeed find very interesting neoantigens in that fusion between two um, pieces of protein that were never meant to be put together um, in the normal cell. And so combining all of these things as well as new uh, information about class two immunity that makes it important to also predict neoantigens for class two, although um, in form and function that's actually quite a bit more difficult than class one immunity, um, we decided to um, really revise PVAC-seq, this pipeline that I told you about earlier, to in incorporate additional levels of sophistication, if you will, and to be able to evaluate different types of um, peptides. So um, these are some of the sort of uh, highlights of what we did um, for this um, vaccine pipeline. Um, I'll just point out that we have class two binding prediction, as well as the ability to predict neoantigens from small insertions and deletions, often which cause a frame shift. And again, a more novel peptide uh, according to the um, wild type um, normal peptide. And we've added in some additional um, downstream support for newer approaches to neoantigen prediction that I don't have time to talk about this morning. Um, and in addition, for those of you who are informatics geeks in the audience, and I know you're out there, um, we also recoded our entire pipeline and then put it in, a, inside, in Python and put it inside of a pip wrapper. So if you're into open source software, you can go to this um, GitHub repository and actually download uh, the most recent version of the pipeline and run it in your own environment if that's um, something that you would like to do. So just to emphasize a couple of the points that I just made, um, this is a small paper that we put together in bioinformatics with Chris Marr and Jin Zhang um, at WashU where we essentially now have this ability to predict from fusion peptides, as you can see um, from um, TCGA data taken from the prostate cancer um, data set, where Tempris 2 erg is a very common fusion in men with prostate cancer, about 48 percent. When we evaluated these um, with these epitopes shown here, with these different HLA allele allelotypes that we were able to call from the exome sequencing data of TCGA, you can see that depending upon the allelotype, you can get a range of different affinities for these um, novel fusion peptides. Um, and so this is uh, just sort of proof in principle that this can be done, and we're moving this forward now in our pediatric patients and hoping to um, identify novel peptides from their um, fusion neoantigens. Um, the, and then this is just the um, approach to MHC class two. As I uh, 
alluded to a few minutes ago, class two binding is much more difficult to predict from computational modeling. And so what we do here is sort of take a, a multi-vote approach, if you will, by using a variety of different methods to predict that peptide binding affinity to the class two molecules in patients. And then we basically take a median affinity value-based approach by evaluating what comes out of each of these three individual predictors. The other component that's important in class two prediction that Ugar Sahin's work has shown us is that the uh, expression level based on RNA sequence data expression is also an important contributor to um, strong uh, MHC class two affinity. And so we use this information as well um, in our final culling of the variants that we're predicting for class two binding. Interestingly, um, recent work from Bob Schreiber's lab now shows us that for neoantigens that score well with both class one and class two predictions, these apparently now are becoming the strongest neoantigens because of the cooperativity between those two types of immune uh, T cells. And um, so we're now adding that prioritization into our pipeline when we evaluate for both. So this is just to summarize what I've just talked about. There are a variety of different tools that we're now compiling together under the PVAC um, name, including this PVAC vector approach. So if you're trying to use this DNA vectoring um, that I mentioned earlier as your vaccine platform, um, this is one way to go about it. So I just want to finish up with a few comments on a study that we just um, uh, finished in, and published in PLOS Medicine with a group from Memorial Sloan Kettering led by Alexander Snyder and also Jeff Hammerbacher's group here at Mount Sinai was integral to this approach. Um, this is a look at urothelial cancer and atezolizumab, which is an anti pdl one drug. Um, and the data from this is correlative data. So it came out of a clinical trial of patients with uh, bladder cancer in the metastatic setting at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and what we did in this study was to sort of try to throw everything we could from the immunogenomic standpoint, much of which I just talked about today, um, at uh, the evaluation of patients who did or did not respond to atezolizumab treatment. And this is really sort of trying to go after this holy grail of figuring out what the best predictors are for patients. I alluded to earlier the fact that mutational load in some ways looks like it might be important. Ironically, in this study, but neither mutational load nor corrected neoantigen load um, gave us a strong signal, but I, I'll show you in a few minutes what did. So basically, we had um, uh, 29 patients that we evaluated using these exome sequencing data. We also evaluated TCR sequencing data um, and compared this both in the um, blood as well as in the pretreatment biopsy. So this is getting at, again, something that was alluded to yesterday, which is if we can't get sequential biopsies from patients to evaluate using genomics and other means, does the circulation actually provide us a route of information to evaluating these patients? So this is one of the many questions that we ask of the immunogenomics data that we generated in the study. And then finally, we um, evaluated all of these in the context of more conventional evaluation for PDL1, which is looking in the microenvironment for evidence of staining uh, for uh, using a PDL1 antibody. And so just a couple of quick figures from this paper. Um, to show you our results. We evaluated everything in the context of durable clinical benefit, either progression-free survival as shown here or overall survival as shown here. And what you can see in these Kaplan-Meier curves is that the evaluation of pre-treatment uh, pre clonality turned out to be very important, um, where TCR clonality in the median, in, as measured in the peripheral blood, provides an important relationship between not only circulating but also intertumoral immunity. And this looks like one of a component of predictors of likelihood to respond. Um, we also noted that peripheral blood expansion of T cell receptors three weeks after treatment um, was an important marker. And then not surprising to anyone who knows about TIL uh, proportion in the tumor, um, this also corresponded with a good outcome. And so this just shows now the different um, associations that we identified between immune and clinical variables. Here we're comparing the TIL proportion as estimated from TCR sequencing to this more conventional immunohistochemistry measurement. Um, and you can see that they um, correlate with one another. And importantly, the hazard ratio in these patients 
with high levels of PD-L1 in the, in the um, tumor microenvironment, rather, associates most significantly with poor outcome. And I, I think just to finish off, the one thing that we did find that was a little bit disappointing, as you can see these three bars here in the context of hazard ratio, re with respect to any level of PD-L1 in the um, microenvironment, is that having liver metastases and aggressive or progressive disease trumps all biomarkers. And so all of these patients had an elevated hazard ratio uh, for um, progression or mortality in spite of this. And one of the things that I think this tells us is that we may need to be a bit more careful about evaluating not only the metastatic status, although metastatic patients go on to these trials to be clear, uh, but also just the immune health of these individuals. And so this is just sort of my um, uh, plug for using the genomics that we're doing in the initial tumor specimen to inform how we evaluate these patients as they go through therapy using current forms of liquid biopsy. So we can not only identify the tumor mutations and track those as we go over time and in comparison to conventional imaging approaches, but we can also use these T cell receptor measures from the periphery as well as other immune correlates to track how patients are doing immunologically, even if they're not, I would argue, on um, strictly immune-related drugs. So I'll finish by saying that um, while I think this is a very exciting field and without delving into all of these bullet points which you can read yourselves, there are still a lot of remaining questions in this cancer immunotherapy um, realm, and in particular in the context of vaccines. I've talked about a few vaccine platforms today, but there are others, and we don't really understand, not only from a cost perspective, but from a scalability perspective, how best to scale these up, what works best, what's most difficult, what's most expensive versus less expensive, et cetera. And this is reflected here in terms of the turnaround time for design and synthesis, and is it going to be clinically relevant as we expand these cases out? And as I've referred already, and as was talked about yesterday, combinations of therapy are almost always the way to go. Um, how do we do these next generation of trials combining vaccines with checkpoint blockades and other immunotherapeutic approaches, all the while making a more refined measurement, if you will, of the immune health of the patient and their likelihood to respond just based on the health of their immune system alone. Um, which we can probably evaluate and monitor using um, both the um, pretreatment biopsy as well as liquid-based um, monitoring as we go forward. So to conclude, I'd just like to hope that I've convinced you that genomics is playing an increasing role in cancer diagnosis and treatment, and immunogenomics in particular has this capability, I think, to really personalize cancer therapy, contribute to the valuation of likelihood of response and to response monitoring. But there are still some major challenges in front of us, um, which should not deter us from pursuing this approach, uh, but still need to be answered appropriately and in a clinical trial setting um, in hopes of maximizing patient response. So I'll thank my collaborators and you for your attention, and I think there may be time for a question or two. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for your talk, uh, fantastic data. So I was wondering whether in your prediction of this new antigen where you take the tumor tissue versus the blood, whether by looking at normal tissue where you know it's been shown that in fact some somatic mutation can accumulate throughout the life of an individual independently of cancer formation, whether this type of additional data will help refine um, the, the identity of new antigen that are linked to the tumor. And I'm referring to mm -hmm. this data where, you know, uh, eyelid, uh, I don't know whether you've seen that this eyelid sure. tissue was, se uh, was uh, sequenced and you know, many mutations had been found independently of tumor formation. So mm -hmm. should we add uh, a tissue, uh, some normal tissue genomic analysis so, to, so to this prediction? Technically speaking, you would be referring to the use of adjacent non-malignant tissue. Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a great idea in principle. I think in practice we rarely see that being obtained. It would have to be from a resection typically or be microdissected out of a tumor biopsy, which can be done, of course, 
um, technically. I don't think anybody's evaluated that yet, and it might be um, more interesting in the context of tissues that often see environmental um, damage, if you will. So colorectal cancer might be a great um, approach. Skin, of course, because of UV damage, yes, absolutely. It's a good point. I, I, we haven't evaluated it yet. We've just conventionally used PBMC because it's easier to get at. Yeah, thanks for that question and thanks for your attention.